So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the end of our first week of doing Real Business of Wine every night from Monday through Friday. I think this must be our seventh um, webcast. And we've done all sorts of things. Last night we had Jancis Robinson. Earlier in the week we, we've had sommeliers. But this one, I think, is going to be a very different sort of um, discussion. So we're going to talk about biodynamics in the broad sense, hence all the, the horns behind me. And we're very lucky to have Monty Walden, who is in Tuscany, um, under house arrest, as, as I guess many of us are, um, where he, A, is the, the man who has written um, a, a, the book on biodynamic uh, wines, we'll talk about that, and indeed uh, guides to biodynamic wines to buy, but also works as a consultant to people who want to go biodynamic, and not, not just that, I think we'll hear about that. Um, from Adelaide, we have uh, Phil Reedman, Master of Wine, um, who used to be a buyer for the British uh, chain um, Tesco's. And um, he's, uh, he's, we we're not going to see Phil because it is four o'clock in the morning. So I think it's quite reasonable for us not to be treated to him in his pajamas. And quite we have, so. uh, so. and uh, also now uh, raising glass, we have Josh Dunning, who is um, an Insta Instagram, almost an instant Instagram wine uh, star. How many followers have you got on Instagram, Josh? Um, I think 23, 24,000, something. Um, over how short a time or long a time? Uh, I think I've, well, I've been writing about wine and um, blogging for maybe 14 months, 15 months. So that's not unimpressive. Um, and you have a particular interest in uh, biodynamics as well. So we'll talk about that. And as in the other evenings, we've got about 30 people um, in the uh, audience. And this is not about uh, Polly Hammond, my partner in crime, you'll see up there, whose tech has been responsible for making this all happen, but also has got a knowledge of, of, of all matters Steiner as well. Um, but we've got, as I said, 20 something um, people in the audience. And I'd love to hear from you, your questions and your comments. Um, and I think we've definitely got one or two producers in the audience there, and I'd love to hear from them. I think Phil Hanford knows about this stuff, I think, for example, and Felicity Carter from Meiningers has also looked into it. So uh, let's go back to you, Monty. How did you, I mean, I've known you a long time. I, I failed to give you a job a long time ago, which was, a, I think, um, maybe a mistake on my side, maybe you not. Did. No, you did, you did. My first, yeah, you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> How long, yeah. ago was, how long ago was that? Uh, early 1990s, I think, and you got me writing for Wine Magazine. Yeah, that's right. And I think I said you didn't, you, you wanted to come and work and run tastings for the magazine. And I said you would be bored out of your mind because yep. you wanted to travel the world and do yep. stuff. Yep. And that's what you went and did and made wine in Chile and various other places, I think. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, that's it. And then how did that turn into you becoming a believer in, in horny stuff? Um, well, in a nutshell, um, I worked in various conventional wineries and in every conventional winery that I worked in, um, we were breaking the rules during in the winemaking because the grapes were not of sufficient quality to be able to um, do lighter fermentations, if you want to use that term. Um, also, my grandfather was a, was a smallholder. He grew all his own food and lived by selling his food. And my dad was very similar. We used to go and work on, on the allotment, so I wasn't afraid of, of getting my hands dirty. Um, but what I liked about, um, I worked, so I worked for an organic vineyard, which was great, um, but I sort of learned with organics the philosophy there in a nutshell. And I don't want to be rude about organics because I'm a big supporter, but it was a lot about um, what you're not supposed to do. It was like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. Um, and when I uh, got into biodynamics, it was more about what you are doing rather than what you're not doing. And I found that quite positive. Um, and also having tried biodynamic wines. Um, my, the first one I tried was in, in Bordeaux in the Fronzac region, which is um, a sort of poor relation to Saint-Emilion. And um, our consultant enologist in our Bordeaux vineyard had recommended I go and visit a guy called Paul Barr. And I said, why? And he said, he's doing something that may interest you. And um, he said that quite um, deliberately because at that time in Bordeaux, it was the era of the um, souped up wines. Michel Roland was king. Um, and I didn't have any love for these wines. I couldn't understand why they were getting 100 points. And that's why, and he, this guy, Mark Gattinier, 
who'd advised all the famous chateaus, the first growths, et cetera, very underrated, under the radar guy. He said, go and see this guy. I said, why? So he's doing something that may interest you. So I turned up, tasted the wines, and they just had this vibrancy that I hadn't found in other, in other wines from um, the Saint-Emilion, Fronzac area. Um, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, nothing really. I said, well, come on, so you've got to be doing something. And then he said, I'm doing this thing called biodynamics. And of course, I asked him what it was, and he didn't have a lot of time to explain. Um, but I went, um, made it my mission um, with a guy called Richard Kershaw, who eventually became a master of wine. And we visited all the, 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 um, the biodynamic vineyards in Bordeaux. And at that time, there were six of them out of probably, I don't know, 10,000, 12,000 uh, wineries. And all of the wines, that even if some of them, a couple of them were a little bit sort of natural, shall we say, um, they did have this vibrancy to them. And also just looking at the vineyards, the vineyards did seem to be balanced. And the two things that I really picked up was that the shoots uh, on the vines were very erect. They were really like this, right? They weren't sort of drooping over the top wire. Um, and that for me was a sign, this sort of, vert you could call it verticality. We talk about verticality in wine, but this was verticality in vine. And it was very clear to see uh, and also in terms of um, just the sort of general feel of the vineyard and the microbiology or the biology of it um, appealed. And so I just carried on and um, eventually by hook or by crook got into writing and started writing about um, biodynamic wine. And in the early days, obviously, it was quite a niche. And obviously, things have changed. And I think the reasons that the reason, main reason why things have changed is um, a lot of people, or probably the vast majority of people, don't understand all of the very sometimes complex biodynamic theory, um, but the wines do stand out. And if you have Romani Conti or Domin Lefleve or even uh, Latour or whatever playing around with biodynamics, they're not doing it for fun. Uh, they're doing it because they can see the difference that it makes to the vineyard, they can see the difference that it makes to the wine, and also you cannot go on amazon.com and order a new uh, set of soil for Romani Conti. Once it's washed off the hillside, it's gone forever. And so I see them doing this, uh, following this slightly weird practice um, as an economic um, decision, as well as a sort of creative decision in terms of wine quality. And I think that's quite a good way of thinking about it. Um, okay. Can I interrupt? So, so I'm going to put my cards on the table. So I'm now, I am, I describe myself as being an agnostic in most fields, and I'm certainly agnostic in this. And basically, like I guess lots of the people watching this and, and, and all of us, I have had brilliant wines produced by biodynamic producers. Some of the best wines I've ever had have been produced by the Leflevs and, and people like um, Vanya Cullen down in, in Western Australia and all sorts of people like that. What I'm not sure on in my mind is whether the wines are great because of all of the biodi biodynamic um, elements and whether if you took one or two elements out of the picture, the, the whole edifice would fall down. And you're, that leads me into what you were just saying just now where there are people who are playing with parts of biodynamic, um, the, the biodynamic structure. And for example, if we go back to Burgundy, when I lived there, there was a guy called Guy Accad, uh, yeah. who, in the, who was very famous in the 70s and is most famous for having quote unquote invented or really uh, created a, a buzz around um, pre-fermentation uh, cold, cold soak. Uh, but in fact, he spent a lot of his efforts in putting uh, the, the soil to rights in the vineyards. Now, he wasn't doing it with, uh, with biodynamic preparations. He was doing it by adding magnesium and adding things that he mm -hmm. saw, saw the soil as missing. He was, that made sense. So I can understand a lot of this, but I'm not sure about whether all of these elements are necessary because, of course, Steiner wasn't a, a winemaker. He wasn't a farmer. Can you talk us through that? Um, well, his, his Steiner's starting point was um, that, you know, we, as we are what we eat. And his idea was um, to create food. Uh, and this is where the weirdy beardy stuff starts. It's both good for body and for soul or mind or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that was really where the um, biodynamic whole idea came from. And one of the things that Steiner would have proscribed would have been, would have been alcohol, obviously wine. So it's kind of ironic that um, biodynamics um, has got more newspaper headlines through wine growing than any other 
other way. I mean, I've written a book on biodynamic gardening, which um, I don't think, I mean, it's obviously been reviewed and stuff, but we don't have huge columns uh, devoted to biodynamic gardening in the magazines. Uh, we do have columns that are devoted to, to biodynamic wines. And um, I mean, for me, it, it, it's very clear when you walk through a vineyard, whether, either whether, whether I'm consulting or whether I'm just going there as a, as a, as a parasitic journalist, is the expression of the vine. And it's obviously hard to see the expression of the vine underground, but it is quite easy to see the expression of the vine above ground, particularly in, in um, how erect the shoots are. And um, one little tip I give people, students, psalms, whatever, when they ask me, how can I see if it really is biodynamic before tasting, is um, the verticality of the shoots. I mean, I don't know if you can see me, but shoots yeah. really go at the top, they don't droop over the top wire. Um, I, I, and, th and that is, for me, a, quite a, a good sign that the idea, sorry, Robert, about this verticality, if you've got it up above ground, you're going to have it underground as well. And we know all the data from Paul Guignon and various other people in terms of more microbiology in the soil and deeper, potentially deeper roots, because there's more oxygen there as well. And there's also more, um, the roots can, uh, are brave enough, if you like, to be able to go and find the food that they want. I get that, but I'm coming back to the question of, of uh, winemakers, or sorry, there are estate owners who say, I want to go biodynamic. And I'm fascinated when I look around the world, that there are some very, and this is a big difference between the biodynamic world and the, the natural world, where we have some very big producers, the Gerard Bertrands of this world, for example, who have some extensive vineyards, Wasse, another one, um, uh, and, and Benziger in, in California, where they really obviously are committed to, to going down a, a, um, a biodynamic route. You've got other people who've got one biodynamic vineyard and everything else isn't even necessarily organic. And I have to ask the question of, are they doing it for marketing purposes? Is it a way of, of adding a bit of um, spark to an expensive blend? And then there's the people in, betw in the, between the two who are saying, well, I want to use the preparations on the soil because I believe that, but I don't believe in stirring the water because I don't believe in give water memory and I, I'm gonna not do the horn. So I don't need to get myself um, certified I'm going to be semi-biodynamic, and I, I, I and you might will you still get the vertical sh uh, the shoots there on those? Um, well, I mean, you, you you may do, yeah. Um, but uh, sorry, Robert, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, well, my question is, you, you're describing what you like to see in a vineyard, and I'm trying to strip to go back under the ground and to everything that went before we got to those shoots. And if that, if we have two vineyards side by side, and one person's done everything except they didn't do the cow poo in the horn or did the, they did the cow poo in a different container, not the horn or whatever, would we not get the same effect? Well, I mean, the biodynamic producer would probably say, no, no, you wouldn't. But unless we've got um, field trials with identical vineyards or vineyards on, say, I know, a flat site, which is all on, on the same kind of geology, um, with uh, placebo preparations being sprayed on, um, then I, I, it's a difficult, you, you know, you can't answer the question really. I think unless that research is done, um, you know, we're all in the dark, if you, if you see what I mean. Josh, have you got some thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, if I put my cards on the table, similar, similar fashion that you did, I think um, by trade, I'm obviously an engineer. Um, sometimes I fall victim to uh, adhering probably too strictly to scientific method and wanting uh, robust evidence for everything in life. Um, but I mean, I've been fortunate to spend time with some really good winemakers in uh, in northern Italy with people like Chiara Boskis and, and speaking to Gaia Gaia and talking about what they've done with biodiversity. And I think I'm a huge advocate of biodiversity. I'm just... I suppose I'm reluctant to, I would like to think that what we discuss in terms of promoting as being beneficial in vineyards, we know is robust in terms of it will work and this is why it works. I think with, um, with biodynamics, there's a little bit, a little bit too much perhaps homeopathy, a little bit too much astrology. Um, I think hidden underneath there are things that obviously do work. As you guys have said, I've tasted some fantastic wines that are biodynamic. I'm not sure whether they're great because they're biodynamic or great because they're just made by winemakers who are conscious of the vineyard, conscious of the their terroir, their community, their people. Um, yeah, I'm reluctant to know or to 
put my flag on whether I think it's because of of certain preparations or the time of barreling or the calendar. Bill, can I move so, across to you? Sorry, Holly. Can I just jump in on that yeah. very quickly? Um, so I, I raised Steiner children, whether they liked it or not, they were forced to come through that. They've stored the 500, they've done the whole biodynamic thing. And that was very much part of our ethos for a long time. And I'm a rational person. So I understand, uh, you know, like the space between what Josh is saying and what Monty's saying, um, there's no way in my thinking to separate the mindset and the care and the love that has gone into the land. When you are that much a part of your surroundings, you are hyper-conscious of the state of your soil and your land and your vines. And is that, it like, I suppose my question would be, do we care? You know, not, does it matter that, that, maybe it's because they care enough to do this in extraordinary process that, that they are producing something that we've got the data that shows we've got sustainable soils that you know, we are healing pieces of land that have been devastated by years of traditional practices. How do we separate that? Those, and, and should we even be having this argument? Monty. Yeah, well, there's a lot to get through there. I mean, what they call it in biodynamics is your intention. I think that's what mm -hmm. Molly was getting at, um, your intention. Um, and also just one quick thing, there isn't, astrology isn't really part of biodynamics at all, um, but ast um, astronomical, um, physical things going on in the atmosphere, but in the celestial sphere above, that is um, some, some wine growers follow celestial cycles. They don't look at the, um, the, the whatever, whatever it's called, the astrology, Mystic Meg in the newspaper. Um, I do think it's, uh, your intention is very, very important. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I come across, obviously people say biodynamic expert, biodynamic guru, biodynamic, yeah, whatever. Uh, I just like a normal person that likes tasty food and, um, and working out in a vineyard. I've worked in vineyards where, you know, you, you come back and you stink because of, because of all sorts of shit you've had to put on the, on the vineyard. And then you get into the winery and you're having to put a mask on to put, to mix something, to stick in the wine because the wine wasn't good enough. Um, I mean, that's really where I come from is the practical side. If someone comes up with a better idea than biodynamics, then I'll, I'll start writing books about that. But I, I can only say in terms of empirically for my own personal experience, my own personal taste, and for many, many others, uh, particularly the winemakers, they're not gonna do this if they don't think it's gonna work. I mean, you do have a very small number of people that blag about their organic or their natural or their biodynamic credentials and then almost always frauds. Um, um, I just think, uh, I, I'm, if, I would say if a better system comes up tomorrow, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be into that. Thanks. Bill, having got you out of bed, you're sitting there in your pajamas, or you might be naked, I, we don't know, but um, <coughs> don't, how do don't you... Don't speculate, you're, Robert. You're, uh, and I'm not going to sleep tonight on that thought, but Bill, are you, you're in Adelaide or just outside Adelaide, and I remember the one last time I was in South Australia, I remember the Wollonga market. They've got, um, uh, I think, biodynamic lamb and biodynamic beef for one of the stalls. Um, and you've done work on the biodynamic calendar. How do you feel generally about biodynamics across, across the board? Um, I, I think um, confused is um, how, how I feel. Um, I admire the, um, the effort that biodynamic grape growers put in into their vineyard, um, the attention to detail that uh, they render to their vineyard and the, the, the winemaking. I'm, I'm sort of even more confused about biodynamic winemaking than I am about grape growing. Um, I, I, I struggle with the sort of biodynamic winemaking concept, but um, certainly the grape growing, um, you know, um, I, I admire the effort that those, those uh, growers make to um, produce, um, you know, high quality grapes, which um, reflect their, their origin or excel at their origin. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the wines that, uh, I always think as, as, as a benchmark and one that really impressed me very early on was um, James and Annie Milton's Chenin Blanc from, from Gisborne. 
um, you know, if you can grow Chenin Blanc in, in, in Gisborne, then, you know, you can, you can do anything because, you know, um, and turn it into a great wine. That is a, a phenomenal achievement. And they, they regularly, um, uh, you know, do and have done for sort of 20 plus years. Um, so I think, um, you know, they, they do a great job. I have tasted other great wines from improbable circumstances that are not uh, made by Biodynamic. So I, I have that sort of uh, confusion. Um, and you've been, uh, tell me about the, the work you did on the Biodynamic calendar, which I'll come back to Monty because the calendar is not part of the original Steiner thing. Um, and I, uh, I have very mixed feelings about this because I personally, and we talked to Jancis about this last night, there are definitely days where I think that wines shine and taste better than they do on other days. And I'm often, other people seem to share my feeling about that. And I've always thought, well, it might be atmospheric pressure or it might be something. And some people say, oh, it's a flower day or a root day or whatever. And you did some work in New Zealand, I think, to, to try to, to, to uh, nail whether the, the calendar works or not, didn't you? I did, yes. Um, the, the, background, the background to that is I, I um, experienced on quite a large scale um, when I was uh, working with Tesco um, some years ago. Um, we, we were setting up the press tasting. We tasted through 200 wines, whittled them down to 100 that we were absolutely thrilled and delighted with. Um, a week later, in the same room, we presented these wines to the uh, to the press, and um, you know, about half an hour into the tasting, my boss said, "Phil, need a word with you outside." And um, I proceeded to get the bollocking of my life, to uh, put it mildly. Uh, he said, "Why are you showing this absolute crock of?" You know, um, you know, this is a disgrace. What are you doing? You know, we've got better wines than this. And I explained largely in vain that, you know, a week ago, you know, it was like shooting ducks in a barrel, you know. Um, but today, I agree, they're not looking good. Um, and, and, you know, someone subsequently suggested that, um, you know, the, the, the biodynamic um, calendar, the, the, uh, the Maria Tum calendar, perhaps we ought to call it rather than the BD calendar, um, was, was at play. And um, at a conference a, a few years ago, at the Brigato conference in New Zealand, um, naturally at the bar after the conference proceedings were over, I um, suggested to... Um, Dr. Wendy Parr from Lincoln University that maybe that this was um, something that was testable and that she should actually um, test um, being a sensory scientist and having the methodology and so forth. Um, so she thought about it and said, yes, we'll do it, but you've got to sort of raise the funds to do it. And so we got the Creswell Jackson uh, Wine Trust to... Uh, give us 5,000 New Zealand dollars. We talked to 12 producers of Pinot Noir from New Zealand and they donated some wines, not knowing why, I have to say. We, we sort of uh, were a little bit uh, um, opaque about the exact reasons we needed the wines other than that we wanted to taste them. Um, and um, with, with 19... Um, tasters in an experiment that uh, Dr. Parr had uh, designed, um, we, we put the, uh, the Maria Plum calendar through its paces. And? And we found absolutely no um, correlation whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I, I did yeah. The, the, the Maria Tun. I was holding my breath there. I thought you were going to say something like, oh my God, it was, we could really see the fruit day. I just don't <laughs> buy that at all. Um, initially, when I heard about it, I thought, well, it's quite a nice theory. 
Uh, it's very cuddly, um, but having done a bit of research and also just my own taste buds, um, I just am not interested in the, you know, people, people, when anybody asks me, is it a fruit day? Um, I'm like, you know, are you a fruitcake? I mean, it just, forget it. It doesn't, it doesn't enter on my radar in terms of the biodynamics. And it's one yeah, of the things well, most, most talked about as well, I think, which I think is really a shame, personally. Yeah, anyway. yeah. well, I mean, it, it, uh, I, I think you, you're right, Monty. I think it is a shame that it, um, it, it is as talked about and it is, it is marketed and it is exploited as a commercial venture, which I think is unfortunate. But not by the bud um, producer. In, it's exploited by importers or people setting up tastings. It's not, honestly, it's not something it, that the biodynamic fraternity would, would uh, they want to talk about. Um, well, you know, not. How great the compost is, I think. They're not talking about fruit days. Yes, I, I would probably agree okay. with that to a significant extent. But I, I would say that there is an industry around it by the ton. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so and people, yeah, yeah. I, I'll send you, I'll send you the, I'll send you the, the paper that was published. It is, it is open access on Clause One. If you Google Par et al, um, you'll you'll find uh, the, the paper. Um, but it is, um, it, it, you know, it, it's the, the interesting thing is it, it shows that there is no correlation with yeah, exactly the, yeah. uh, the predicted yeah. uh, thing. But it, it still does leave open the, the, the question of why I got that bollocking from my boss and why Robert and others similarly report um, wines that we're familiar with tasting, apparently tasting and expressing differently on different days. Can I just chip in for a second? I think when you published um, that paper, when that, pub pub that paper was published, and I uh, watched what happened, the number of people who went on social media and said, oh, yes, but they were tasting Pinot Noir, and they would have seen more effect if they'd had Cabernet Sauvignon or whatever. And Monty, I can see your head shaking. Um, can I just inter ask Felicity Carter? I don't know if uh, you're going to have your camera on or not, Felicity, but Felicity, you've not. got some... You've got some thoughts on the on Monty's point about astrology and not astrology. Would you like to chip in on that? Okay, so I have to start by saying that I used to work as an astrologer many years ago, so I understand astrology pretty well. I, I also, if you read uh, Rudolf Steiner, he misunderstood the difference between what's called the tropical zodiac and the sidereal zodiac. Um, Maria Toon was using the tropical zodiac, but both of them were definitely using astrology. Um, everything that Steiner said about the, you know, the four elements, which goes back to the Greeks, earth, air, fire, and water, um, is absolutely astrology. You know, biodynamics is not using cosmic forces. It's using classical astrology that uh, Ptolemy in the second century AD would have, uh, BC would have absolutely understood as astrology. Um, so I just, I just want to jump in there and say that you, you can't say that they're not using astrology because they are. Thanks, thanks Felicity. Um, Monty, got a thought on that? Or? No, I mean, I could totally agree. I mean, at the, when I worked at Berkeley and Wolf, um, I've done various bits, but um, they were really initially quite shocked that I didn't give a shit about fruit days and root days. I said, look, we, eight, 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 we have 80 hectares of, of vineyard to deal with and we don't have, and we have enough people, but we can't do everything by the, by the, the way we work under me is we're working by the weather and by the personnel and which tractors working and that, that's how we do things. We're not looking at the frigging calendar. I don't give a shit about the calendar. I don't want to hear about the calendar. It's got nothing to do with quality. Quality is about quality humans, quality machinery, doing the right job at the right time. Full stop. Brandon. Can I throw in some quest a question from Dan Brennan? A few questions actually from Decibel Wines in, he's both in the US and in New Zealand. So the first question is, I don't know if we do these both together or separately. I was wondering what you've seen and experienced with biodynamic wine growing on very rocky soils. There are some organic vineyards here on the Gimlet gravels in Hawke's Bay in New Zealand, which is a very unique appellation. So I'm not thinking it would be too tough, but certainly unique with its own set of needs and demands. These are the most free draining soils I've ever seen and many vineyards not only irrigate, but have used fertigation in the past to help with magnesium deficiencies, etc. So what would be the advantages and techniques in using biodynamic dynamic practices on very stony, 
free draining soils. A, a, a quick, a short answer may not be easy on that, but Monty, any thoughts for that? Well, I mean, ultimately what you're going to try and do is, we, in the biodynamic speak, you would be, it's a very solar place because you've got a hot climate above you and you've got hot soil behind you, uh, underneath you because it warms up very quickly. You've got to just find a way uh, of minimizing or reducing the heat, um, either by um, counterintuitively maybe sow sowing a cover crop that will grow not very high, not very competitively to shade those gravels so that they're reflecting less heat back onto the vines and causing potential stress. He's yeah. then gone on to say, he's obviously quite keen on moving into this, with limited but some biodynamic farming in any particular region and in turn a big learning curve and limited access to preparations in the early days, how would you recommend getting started? Are there a few absolutes like getting your own cow, for example? I mean, I guess rather than next door neighbor's cow. Not really, no. It's like, it's like me by having to get Steve Jobs before I buy an Apple computer. You've got to, you've got to take things... Um, Simply and slowly, basically what you have at your disposal in terms of manpower and machinery. Um, you just, I would say, repeat, you think about um, your vineyard in a very solar place, a very hot place. Try and turn down the temperature um, by sowing something that will, as I said, shade those, uh, shade, shade those gravels and make sure um, that you're not doing anything with your pruning and canopy management to exacerbate um, the lack of water and the high intensity of the sun. Thank you. Soma Jennings, who actually helped us put together the first of, of these sessions and who works with me uh, part of the time, has got a couple of questions. Soma, go ahead. Um, hi there. I just wanted to um, go back to Polly's uh, question, which was, should we actually be asking this question? Should we be debating it? And in my mind, yes, absolutely, we should be because, and I'm I'm glad we are today, um, because if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if, if we're saying that this is the best way of growing grapes, then why aren't we all doing it? Okay, it takes time and is more expensive, but if it's the best, then why aren't more people doing it perhaps instead of all? And secondly, if, if there's um, a lot of people who are following the full biodynamic set of um, guidelines or instructions or however you call them um uh, you know is are they doing a lot of unnecessary work and can we actually revisit it and redefine biodynamics to find out what actually makes the difference and propose those as the guidelines instead yeah Monty, that would basically go, could go back to doing some of those um, a versus B testing that we do, as Polly would say, in, in the tech world, we wouldn't just say A works, we would actually test A versus B and B versus C. Why, why aren't we doing that? Because after all, Steiner did say, as I, as I understand it, that this was the, what he gave us was the first step. I don't think he expected necessarily everybody to be following his tablets of stone um, half a century or heading for a century later. Yeah, I'm not sure if that question was for me, but um, it, it kind of uh, was. It, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, not all biodynamic growers kind of follow the same recipe, even though the fundamentals are um, things that most people do. Um, you've also got a lot of viticulture from the viticultural book in terms of the basic stuff. You know, if you have a in biodynamics as a consultant, if I turn up at a vineyard which is on the wrong rootstock and the wrong with the wrong uh, cultivar in the wrong place with the wrong team of people you can throw as much whole manure as you want at that vineyard and it's not going to work so um, there, there is an, an aspect of common sense and I think um, the people who are negative about biodynamics and I can understand why uh, I'm not into the weirdy beardy kind of philosophers um, what it does teach you is, com is you is common sense is your best tool um, whether you're conventional or sustainable or organic or biodynamic. And if you don't have that common sense, um, such as accepting the fact that you're going to plant a vineyard uh, for 20 years and you, you're, going to, you're going to say, yeah, so I don't mind having the wrong rootstock. That's just a completely moronic decision. Um, and if we look at um, when there are planting booms, for example, when the rich guys get in to some trendy new region, like I know Cortona, for example, um, planting the wrong scion on the wrong rootstock. Um, there's a reason why those rinds are really tricky. It's a very hot solar place and they haven't got their, their building blocks right. So that's irrespective of biodynamics, it's just the common sense. So 
And I apply um, biodynamics, um, sorry, common sense to, to biodynamic farming. Um, it's as much about who your team is as, as much as where your terroir is. If we look at 10, 20 years in, advance, in the future, do you think that the, the biodynamic um, methodology and indeed what Demet, the, the Demeter of 10, 20 years time is certifying will be the same set of rules that, we're, that the people are actually applying today to get their Demeter certification? Yeah, I think they will. I think the fundamentals, I mean, you know, I, I repeat, you know, the, the people do it, Romani Conti are not doing it for fun. I mean, they don't forget, had a, had a sort of a battle with uh, uh, Lalu Bislawa, who's very fundamentalist about biodynamics, and they didn't want that. They just wanted to use the tool uh, where it was applicable and where it would be useful and where it would help the soils and the wine um, without all the bullshit that goes with it. And that is the, the page, the same page that I'm on. And I think, yes, the world that we're looking at, the, the whole point of biodynamics was to have food that's good for both body and, and, and spirit, not in terms of you're going to eat biodynamic food and go to the church the next day, but good that it's good for body and uh, good for body and soul. And I think that's a good way of proceeding. Now, whether you want to do biodynamics or find some other way of doing that, I do think that's a good track to take. Um, what, and, what uh, you've, can, I, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Monty, just um, for clarity, myself and maybe others on here, as I suppose the subject subject matter expert amongst us, um, what facets of biodynamics do you think are, you know, quote unquote bullshit, and which which do you think aren't, and and how have you come to that decision in terms of which you've you, which factors you've dissected out as, you know, I'm not I'm not going to adhere to this, but I do think that this is effective. How, how have you come to that decision, and what are they? Well, all the, all the physical stuff that you do in terms of the preparations themselves of making compost and putting the compost preps in and making a horn manure 500, which goes on the soil, which is a sort of a cow manure liquid, and then the horn silica. Um, I, I like using them. I like making them because they're safe. I don't have to open a pesticide can. And I can see the result that happens in the vineyard. When I started working at Berkeley and Wool, for example, uh, I said, after, in, after eight years, you, you, you can let me go, you can fire me, because it's going to take me about eight years to get this, this vineyard, um, these vineyards back to normal. Then you could see quite clearly, and, we, and a analysis as well has shown, in terms of the roots can find, there's more oxygen in the soil and they can go deeper down and then they can express themselves with this verticality above the ground. It has an effect on the wine, it changes your numbers uh, in, in, the, in the winery in terms of your acidity, pH, all the rest of it. Uh, the fermentability is much easier because you're not lacking nutrients. Um, you just, it just everything suddenly, this, the whole process is a chain of, of, of little things, cogs that have to turn all together to make a great wine. And the easy, and the hard part is finding the best terroir. Um, but I always said, if, if something better comes along, I'll start doing that. But in terms of a, of a relatively quick tool for a perennial crop, a high value perennial crop wine growing, turning that super tanker, which, which is what any vineyard is, no matter how big or small, around over seven or eight years by using plants, which is what you're doing, you're using digested plants, uh, shit, cow shit, or, or actual plants, and one, the, the world's most abundant mineral, which is silica. So we're not going to run out of any of those things, of course. Yeah. For me, that I just think that's a really good way of working. And as I, I repeat, if something better comes along... Um, I, a bit, but I don't, I'm not a church going biodynamic guru. I just, I'm not, I, I, I look at the tool and I like the tools. They're easy for the staff to make. Um, and um, and I, I think probably the, the most underrated thing in biodynamics is the actual compost. If you think about what's, what you're feeding with the conventional fertilizer to vines is you're feeding them salt effectively and they're in a freaking hot climate already. Um, and that's going to mess up your numbers in terms of your acid strength and all the rest of it, as well as, uh, causing too much vigor so you have weaker cell walls and the vines become more susceptible to, to pests and diseases. The idea you can clearly see the expression of the vine it just becomes yeah. tighter and leaner and it's more resistant it's like it's like your tummy if you've got a fat beer belly and I punch you it's going to hurt if you're if you've got a washboard tummy I, I punch you it, it, it's not going to hurt you and in terms of this thing with the cell walls of the, of the of the leaves for example that's how I think, and that's and science suggests that it or says it's it, that is what that is what is happening. The vines become tighter. But can and I come back to jo Josh's question? Because there are the elements like stirring the water. If we don't, if we didn't stir the water, would we see? Yeah, well, the, you can argue about the, the stirring. You're right. That's a good way. But the stirring the water, um, you can look at it two ways. A by aerating, like making a yeast thing. You, aer you aerate it. That's just a physiological, a physical thing. 
uh, and that works, uh, you know, we know that. And the biodynamic people say there's also a spiritual thing, as they call it, a spiritual thing. When I'm stirring a bucket of, of cow shit in a, in a bucket with some water, you know, I'm kind of thinking I want to do this properly. I'm not thinking this is going to take me to some higher spiritual plane. It's nice work to do. That's how I think about it. But some people really do believe that there is some spiritual aspect, which is fine, but it's not harmful. I don't think if they think that. I personally don't, don't, I personally don't, don't feel that. But even having consulted to wineries, they've all got the same results in terms of um, the, 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 the higher quality, uh, even though their consultant was a, a charlatan, which is me, you know, a non-believer, if you like. And, uh, um, so I don't really go into the, the kind of spirituality side of things. I, for me, it's a practical tool that works. Can I, can I bring Karen Jenkins in here? Karen, um, I don't know if you've got a camera on or not, but please go ahead with, you, with your question about the calendar. Karen, are you there? Karen, I'll read your question if you can't. Um... Hi, Karen, if you can hear me. Karen? Okay, I'll read your question. Um, re regarding your comment that biodynamic calendar concept was exploited by importers, I think you could say that biodynamics is more often misunderstood, um, in quotes, right across the tray. What are the key points you'd use to describe biodynamics to help people grasp the concept more effectively? Okay, I would come back with a very simple answer, which is um, the concept of terroir is very important in wine. The less off-farm inputs you, you put on your vineyard, the stronger that sense of place should be in the wine. And one of the key things about biodynamics, probably the key thing, is that you have to generate your own fertility on the farm. Thanks for that. Um, actually, there's, I'm going to actually let Felicity back in for a second because I think she's got, a, I think, a very good point which ties in with what we were, what we were just um, talking about in terms of evolution. Um, Felicity, do you want to have a quick word about the, the preparations? If you okay, know. sorry, I don't mean to, um, uh, to dominate this conversation. Monty, I've got your book next to me. and I find, I, I've read the whole thing. It's a fascinating book. I, I loved it. But one of the things I want to ask is one of the defining characteristics of pseudoscience is that the thing doesn't change even as evidence changes. And the preparations that have been used have been used since the 1920s, and they haven't changed in that time. People are still using nettles and yams and they're still using deer bladders and skull. Why are people using the same preparations? Is there any research to discover if there are better plants or better enclosures to use? And why should people in the Southern Hemisphere be using Northern Hemisphere plants like nettles and yarrow? Yeah, that's a good question. About the, yeah, it's a good question about the Southern Hemisphere. Um, there is a substitute for horsetail uh, down there. Um, I suppose the, the easy answer is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and um, you know the, the the steady drip drip of first growth, uh, top wineries and also lesser wineries that none of us have ever heard of, um, t taking up biodynamics because they can see and feel the taste of their neighbour or their competitor. Um, it, it kind of, in a way, is a good thing, but in a way, is what you're saying it's a bad thing because it kind of shows that biodynamics is is content to ossify, um, if you like, um, but. You know, if I always if, if a better system comes up, let's go. Let's adopt the uh, better system. Um, why um, the biodynamic movement also is is terrible at um, organising itself. It's been terrible at marketing and communicating what it does. Um, so I think they they like the idea of sticking with the same formula. Uh, the ultras do certainly. Um, in Australia, you had a guy called Podolinsky who was quite sort of avant-garde. <clears throat> and reacting to Australian conditions um, and his um, innovation there without going into too many details it does get used in Europe um, but it doesn't really work in Europe for me because it, it creates a, a situation where you actually have vineyards with very shallow or non-complex roots um, because um, that suits Australia where you have um, salinity um, not too deep down um, it doesn't really suit the, the um, European way of doing things so innovation is fine but it it can actually be a retrograde step as well as a, as a sort of ergo, you know, uh, moving forward. Thank, thanks for that. I'm going can to I, bring in. Can sorry. I jump in on that really yeah, quickly? Go ahead. Um, having, having been involved with the biodynamic movement in New Zealand, um, 
one thing that I would say that Felicity's talking about, and it's interesting how much this question is really coming back to um, parsing down the bare bones and implicit versus explicit, and, and, and how much does anthroposophy still play a part in this? And Monty just touched on issues of communication. So we deal with this all the time. In New Zealand, we have producers who, unless you understood the secret handshake of their label, you would never know that they are a biodynamic producer. And that is because this can be so contentious and misunderstood and ambiguous. So I wonder, Monty, could you talk about, you know, is this like natural wine where we're just going to fight about it forever? Is there a way that we can reach some sort of consensus or language that allows for clearer communication of what this imparts and how much of it we're adopting uh, producer by producer? Well, it's a nice ideal to aim for, but it, no, I, don't, I mean, you can even talk about maybe three people who, who, can, who farm can really, really conventionally straight out of the box. You ask them a question, they'll give you three different answers on how they do it, even though they're using exactly the same sprays, which is exactly what we do in biodynamics. You know, do you spray horn silica 501? Yes. Do you make compost? Yes. Do you spray horn manure? Yes. So, um, no, I don't think it's going to change. Um, I think um, where the biodynamic movement has been an utter, a complete failure is um, seeing the success of wine um, because it's based on taste. It tastes good. Forget all the weirdy beardy bullshit. This, the wines taste good and the wine growers say they taste good and critics agree that they taste good and better or different anyway. Uh, they really should get their shit together and sort out our food, um, the way that the food that we eat. And that really was the main mission, I think, of Stein. He didn't drink wine uh, or he was an anthropost, an anthropos, so he didn't want to um, have alcohol in his body. Uh, that's been, for me, the biggest failure. Um, completely and I think I'd love to see more vineyards and when I do talks now I say to all the vineyards stop getting on a frigging plane spend that money create a, a, a vineyard a, a garden sorry to feed your staff and if you if your staff are eating stuff that comes off the same terroir as your wine you can say that we have terroir driven wine winemakers and, and, and employees as well as quote a terroir driven wine and that idea comes from when I work with the Fetzer family in, the, in California and I grew the food for our vineyard work, workers, most of whom were, were, um, were Mexican and we grew exactly the food that they liked eating. And I just like that idea of keeping it local, in the, in the, really in the best sense. Um, and so that's what I would focus on. And um, there we go. That ties in really well to our next question for Carrie. Carrie, are myself. you there? I am here. Okay, go hey, for Kate. it. Hello from sunny Toronto. Um, so what question I have is about certifying bodies. I deal with uh, winemakers in Austria and Italy and various places, some of whom are very suspicious of certifying bodies. We certainly see that in our country here um, uh, as kind of almost like a cash grab and a bit of a big brother about the way people are producing wine. I'm just curious about your opinion on these certifications. Is that for me? Yes, Monty. Oh yeah, I'm a big believer in certification. Uh, there are two two reasons for that. Um, you're making a you're making a, a public statement, um, and you have to back that up in conventional farming. No matter you know all the, the bullshit about biodynamics and stuff. Um, you know, conventional farmers probably at some stage will be asked to write down exactly which sprays they're using and where they're using them and how much they use. Uh, this is what you have to do in organics and biodynamics. I think it's a they good. They are at the moment, Monty. To be fair. Not spray really. Not di really. Spray diaries have to be spray diaries. Have yeah, but they're not. Completed. They're not getting. They're not getting. Um, not every single producer is on on the planet is getting is getting checked like the organic uh, producers or the biodynamic producers are. Um, Indeed not. You know, and I mean, every one of the reasons again I got into biodynamics was every single winery, conventional winery I worked in, we were breaking the rules. We were cheating because, I, and the reason not because we were nasty people. Was because the quality wasn't there, and um, we had to. You worked for the wrong places, Monty. No, I, 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 well, yeah, I worked for some quite well-known people, um, and um, uh, some of them didn't cheat, but some of them did. Monty, can I throw in the question? We, we're talking very much about biodynamic, and obviously, you've got these areas that I think are often confused between biodynamic. Uh, organic and natural and then sustainable on the side. And organic, there's a lot of um, chatter at the moment about the question of copper. Uh, 
in organic and a lot of people are saying it's all very well but you're putting effectively a poison into the ground that's not going to leave the ground where do you stand as a biodynamic uh, as a person within, within the biodynamic world in terms of those kind of issues uh, monty well i think i mean uh, raising copper is a, is a, um, a good one i mean let's also remember that conventional sprays do do um contain copper as well not all of them but some of them do uh, my answer is pretty pretty clear. If you if if coppers are really something that we all want to eliminate, that's fine. Whether we're conventional, organic, or biodynamic, we probably won't have too many vineyards left unless we go down the interspecific crossing route. And if that's the way we want to go, that's fine because um, the wines aren't that complex, but they're certainly perfectly drinkable, uh, and um, they require minimal. They do require some attention, but generally speaking, require minimal. Um, minimal spraying, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too upset if, if we went down that route at all. Seriously, you, you you mentioned the word intent earlier, which I thought was interesting because that does bring us into the natural uh, kind of into the some the, the, the philosophy of natural work, natural wine, where people say it's not to do with certification; it's to do with what we are trying to do. And I'm interested to to hear that you do think that you need a certifying agency. But the interesting thing is the certifying agencies within uh, biodynamics are commercial bodies, um, which, well, certainly Demeter is a commercial body, that, which yeah, also but makes that interesting. But they, that's a private certification. So, um, but to be organic, you then, you have, sorry, to be biodynamic, first and foremost, you must be certified organic by the, by the government, whether it's the French government or the German government or the Australian government. So. Um, you're adding on your own private extra little tag, um, which is, um, as you say, they're sort of private bodies. I mean, I'm not, not saying they're sort of listed on the stock exchange, but they are, it's a private standard or a, a personal standard. Um, I think we've got another thing. There, there is somebody making the point here that, that um, in some, in New Zealand and Australia, they are using alternative preparations uh, where necessary. And I think maybe that that's something that I, uh, would you be, if somebody said to you, would you like to run some um, parallels and some, some tests to, to actually move things? Because you said that, that some of the Australian preps don't work in, um, in Europe, but who's to say what else might? Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a debate always in the biodynamic community whether um, you know more you can add to quote Steiner's work. Um, I'm not really part of that, to be honest. I still think um, biodynamics is the cherry on the cake. Um, you've got to have the right cultivar on the right terroir on the right rootstock with the right trellising with the right workers uh, and the right philosophy of the winery uh, to make it work. And the biodynamic um, voodoo, whatever is is the, is the cherry on the cake. It's not the be all and end all, um, particularly in, in the in the wine industry. Um, but you know the thing with bi what biodynamics came about it wasn't really to do with wine. It was to do with just growing healthier food um, for people because it came about in the mid twenties after the First World War, where we, um, you know, tanks um, became tractors and um, pesticides. Um, sorry, um, nerve gas became pesticide and. Um, and that was the, kind of the starting point for the biodynamic movement. Um, you know, if I didn't drink wine again, I would be a little bit upset probably, but if I had some great vegetables to make nice soup every day, I'd still be a happy camper. Gosh, you've got your, your 20,000 people who, are, who actually, well, I don't know how many of them every day are, are looking at what you do while you're posting wines and tasting notes and descriptions. How many of those people do you think, and I think quite, are we talking about a, a, a very heavily millennial focused uh, audience, the first question, then, but how many of them? Well, let's, to, for, for, um, for sake of being accurate, if I get my phone up, let's have a look at the average age of audience. Yeah, so the, the sort of 70% of my Instagram is between 24 and 44. And so of those people, how would you say they, if you were to go out and talk to them, where do you think they stand in terms of going out and buying wine? with yeah. biodynamic on the label or, or being told by you that they're biodynamic rather than anything else? Surpri surprisingly varied. I, I have these discussions quite frequently actually on um, on Instagram with, with many people who, who follow me and I follow them. And it's it's a very varied opinion. There's, I have a lot of people who follow me who are um, advocates of biodynamic farming. I have a lot of people who follow me who aren't. And I think I think I appreciate both, both sides of the argument. I think... Um, what I would say from a millennial perspective, well, from me anyway, I, I agree with Monty in that I, I do like the idea of certifying bodies. Um, I would, I would like to 
I suppose, understand what do you think the public statement is of putting a biodynamic label on a wine? What does it say to the consumer? Or, or, or what, does it, what does it tell someone? Is it, is it that the wine is better or is it that the, the farming is better for the environment? Or Well, it, I mean, it's a good question. But it doesn't really say anything. That doesn't really tell anybody anything um, because, you know, it's just another stamp you know on a, on a on a product it's like if i go to i know ikea or something it says the the forest yeah. was was read a bedtime story every night before we cut the frigging tree down you know <laughs> it, it's a it's a minefield out there yeah um, they some um producers a very small number who are certified they have to be certified organic first then they get maybe the demeter certification for biodynamics they don't put that on the label because they just want to say buy my wine yeah uh, because it's good and it just happens to be biodynamic which i i do agree with um, it is a vexed yeah. question. It's a good question. I don't really have a, a, a great answer for you. Um, yeah. I, like, personally, I, I do like wineries that are certified um, because I said the majority of vineyards I've worked on were, were, were cheating. And I, I, like, I like this, you know, third party independent, um, you know, check what's in your drawers. I like and, it. And sitting there, Phil, in New Zealand, if you're still with us and still yeah. sorry, in, yeah. in Adelaide, um, if you're still awake, um, yeah. how do you see... Uh, Australia's been actually behind the ball in terms of going sustainable compared to New Zealand, and indeed, I think in terms of organics. Um, what do you see happening there in terms of, of um, uh, a biodynamics beyond the, the pioneers that we know already? Yeah, I mean, I think Australia has, as, as you say, been a, a bit uh, slow out of the blocks uh, on, on this one. Um, if, if I could just... Um, go back to the certification question before I answer the question you actually asked me, Robert. Um, I, I, I do agree that from a, a consumer integrity point of view, um, certification is needed. Um, it, it, you know, if you're going to make that claim that you're biodynamic, it needs to be a verifiable claim. Uh, and I think for consumer uh, protection, um, they deserve, consumers deserve that certification. Um, but I, I think um, in, in common with many sort of um, certifying bodies for various different uh, aspects of life, I think those certifying bodies are more um, interested in their own ends than actually promoting the types of product that they are certifying. And I, I think that there is a massive role for the people taking the certification um, funds to um, promote and explain to the world what those products are and, uh, and what the benefits of them are. Um, but um, that, that spiel said, um, back to your question, um, I think we are seeing some really exciting but belated um, development here. Um, I think um, uh, Darren Berg in McLaren Vale have a, a huge number of uh, vineyards and they are um, both, both their own and those that they buy from and they are all certified biodynamic. Um, they've marketed, I think, two or three wines thus far as being um, biodynamic wine. Um, so I think having sort of 200 hectares um, in McLaren Vale or Darrenburg of, of biodynamic is, is a, 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 a great move forward. Um, you know, perhaps seeing some more wines labelled thus would, uh, would, would help the category here. But McLaren Vale as a whole is, is a bit of a hot spot for biodynamics and I think that's that's really exciting. We've got sort of Paxton there. We've got Battle of Bosworth doing um, some, some great things. So I think um, we, we are seeing um, a, a, a belated growth in, um, in, in this area. And um, it, it's very exciting to see. Actually, Josh, before I go any further, Josh, I've got a question. Somebody's asked for your Instagram um, name could you your handle on instagram can you share that with us uh word word on the grapevine thank you for that uh, monty do you want to actually answer that quickly then to answer phil's point there what about australia yeah yeah i mean i think the great thing for australia they were a little bit late to the party 
um, but um, their their sense of empiricism is is much needed, I think, in biodynamics. And also, they can take take um, they can see all the the screw ups that people have made in other countries, uh, particularly in, in with Australia's quite unique growing conditions in the main, to not make the same mistakes uh, and to do a really good job. And I think if I was in Australia, obviously, I come back to this: it's a very solar place in general, um, and really just the good old fashioned organic stuff, like really making sure that you've got that sort of buffer in your soil so that you don't get those, uh, don't get the heat stress and the sunburn and all the rest of it. Um, that for me would be my first target as a, if I was consulting. I think uh, you see the back, change in my background means that anybody who's at a loose end can come across to Joe's bar where the conversation will continue. Um, you can see on the, the chat, you know, the chat button, you can see where to come. But I think my favorite line on, on um, biodynamics was a New Zealand uh, estate owner, winery owner called Michael Saracen, who's a very down to earth Brit, who's also a, a top cinematographer. And I said to him, do you really believe in this stuff? And he said, oh, I don't know really. He said, but I like employing people who are prepared to get up in the middle of the night and stir water. And I think there's a lot in that. I yeah. think that the work, and, and this is something, I think this kind of chimes with what you're saying, Monty. The fact that people are prepared to make the effort and, and follow, whether it's a creed or a set of rules or whatever it is, um, is almost certainly going to contribute something positive to the wine rather than just spraying a whole load of other stuff and, and going on holiday. Mm -hmm. Just to say one time, what I like about the biodynamic thing is forget, you know, we have discussions about copper, etc. If you're just doing biodynamics for your garden, uh, you are going to be, you won't need anything. You, you, you'd just be working with like chamomile flowers and things like that. Um, no copper, nothing at all um, uh, controversial. Uh, and um, that is what I really, the fundamental, that's what I, what I really like about it. getting out there, doing it and a lot of manual labor is good for body, good for, good for your mind. Um, and you're not destroying the environment, you're creating healthy food. That for me, that's the fundamental part. That's the fundamental bit of biodynamics. Um, and if I don't, if I have to leave the wine trade, I, I, I would grow vegetables and I would live a very, very happy man. Monty, thank you very much. Anybody who hasn't read Monty's book, please go and get it. Um, I don't know how fast you can get it delivered, but get it online or whatever. Um, What's the title of the book? Monty? Uh, it's called Biodynamic uh, Wine, I think, and it's uh, <laughs> published in Oxford by Infinite Ideas. That's right. And you've got a biodynamic, you've done a guide on wines to buy as well, which I think you put out. Yeah, that was well, a while ago. Right? Yeah, a bit oh, out yeah, but, that, but the producers, some good producers in there. So I'd like to thank everybody again. We're finishing actually more on time than we, we normally do, but um, I, I think, Monty, you've got a dinner sitting behind you from what I can see behind you being prepared. So I'd like to say thanks to everybody who's participated. Please, the video will be up, um, I think, in the next a uh, few days. Um, we've got Jancis's video is already up. The podcasts now, thanks to Polly and her team, everything becomes a video and a podcast and the transcriptions are all going out. Monday, if you've got nothing better to do at the same time, we've got a team of 10 people from Bordeaux, including Jane, Hans uh, Jane, um, from, uh, from, uh, Jane Anson from Decanter, uh, looking at the 2019 vintage. There's no on Primer, but we've also got some interesting tech stuff where we've got an Italian team who are looking at the vineyards from uh, satellite imagery and from local uh, weather data to actually try to see whether we can uh, guess how good a vintage it's going to be before we even taste the wines from space. So thank you all. Come across to the bar if you've got nothing better to do. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening and come back Monday. We're doing natural wine later next week as well. Oh, so my favourite. You haven't tried to be on that. I uh, Come along, Monty. Uh, it'll be an interesting, uh, sparky <laughs> evening, I think. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks. Nice Bye.